What's up everybody, I'm Matt Leiner, 2004 Heisman Trophy winner, and you're watching the Harris Highlight Show. Coming to you live from the Bill Austin Radio Studio at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism in beautiful downtown Phoenix. This is episode 13 of season 3 of the Harris Highlight Show. Joining me this week is our college football expert, Josh Schaefer, who's currently working on Lyle's camera right now, or is currently working on his camera. We got Lyle Goldstein, college football analyst, and our executive producer, Brady Klain. I'm your host for the evening, Blake Harris. Now... Brady, I have no idea what's going on in here. What's we're, up, buddy? We are we were starting the show, and all of a sudden, Josh went over to work on his camera. He uh, has his hands up in the air, so I'm not entirely sure what's. I don't know what's going on right now. So, Josh is going to work with whatever's going on, and uh, we're just going to keep the ball rolling because, as they say in show business, the show must go on. The show like. must go on, and the show will go on because this week's episode is sponsored by the Ridge. Wallet. The Ridge is a minimal front pocket wallet it's designed to let you ditch that bulky wallet. It comes in titanium, carbon fiber, aluminum, a bunch of other cool different styles and colors. Don't carry around that loaded wallet anymore. It looks better, weighs less, and just keeps everything intact. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping by going to ridgewallet.com slash HH. Use code HH for 10% off. Are, are we good to go? I mean... You tell me, camera number four. I don't know what's going on. Well, the red light is on, so... uh, And there's nothing on the screen saying that, hey, Josh, you suck. So I don't... Well, I I can tell you that, Josh. You suck. It it said that a couple minutes ago. That was the exact wording on the camera. I was very upset to see that. How rude. I mean, as you were counting us down, it just went black, so... Well, we needed some excitement uh, before the show, but for those that are listening, yes, it is... A little different. We are recording on Sunday night because, well, we're all going to be gone for Thanksgiving this week. Well, I I leave tomorrow. I don't know when you, you guys leave tomorrow. I leave tomorrow. How are you going to edit the show? I leave Thanksgiving. I'm going to be up all night pulling an all nighter. All right. Yeah, it's it's what you got to do in situations like these. You know, you're going to be up all night. It's it's one night, but if that means I can get the show out in time, so be it. But we are recording live. At 8 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Mountain Time, normally we're recorded about 8.30 Mountain Time, 10.30 Eastern. So hopefully we have a lot of, not brand new listeners, but more listeners that can listen this week. So if you're listening live right now, thank you. Welcome to the show. Also, if you're listening to the show live right now on blazeradioonline.com, make sure to head over to Twitter where you can follow us at the HH Show underscore. That is the HH Show underscore. You can interact with us live. We are going to be reading your tweets, you know, having you guys give your thoughts, and pretty much just having a fun time for the next hour and a half over here on blazeradioonline.com. Well, there's the the radio promo, there's the Twitter promo. It's officially time now to start talking about the games from this past weekend because the college football playoff rankings aren't out yet, so we're going to be going based off what we think there. I think, I think guys, we're going to have to go back to the AP poll. No. I think we're going to have to Stop. dive deep Stop. into the AP poll. Can we just not talk about how bad it is and just sort of just talk about it? I know. Let's let's talk about the games first and the best game from this past week. And now it seems like a recurring theme, at least for me, where Ohio State somehow always finds himself in like one of the best games of the year. So they beat Maryland 52 to 51. They go into overtime. And for the third week in a row, guys... We are going to be talking about a two-point conversion. This time, it was a two-point conversion that was failed. Now, I'm not going to blame Maryland for this because if you saw the play, the quarterback, I don't know what he was doing. If he saw someone in the stands that was wearing a Maryland jersey that he thought he was throwing it to, he had someone wide open. He missed him. Maryland loses the game. Ohio State, their season is I guess they still have a chance at the college football playoff. They definitely still have a chance at the Big Ten title game. But Ohio State, Maryland, what a game. There's no need to question whether or not Maryland was smart going for two because at this point in their season, they have nothing to lose. And so it, was, what, it should have worked. And it should it have worked. Have so worked. It, was, it was a it fantastic was call. Open. I guess this is more so now. 
Ohio State for it, we it, we talk about their defense every week it seems where their defense is just an absolute joke. They allow 51 points. Is Ohio State this good? I mean, they're the ranked tenth right now in the playoff rankings. They'll probably stay at ten, maybe move to nine. Are they a top ten team? Are they a team that actually has a chance to make the college football playoff? You know what, Blake? They're a team that deserves to be ranked in the top ten, but I don't think they have any chance to make the college football playoff. I guess logistically, the answer would be yes, they can. I think they need a lot of help, and they need to somehow get past a Michigan team who I think is going to will save that for the Pickums. Um, but but look, here's the way that the season has progressed, at least in my opinion, for Ohio State. It started out with Dwayne Haskins is your quarterback, who at one point Lyle and I both mostly Lyle, so blame Lyle. We both we both made an argument for why this guy should be considered to win the Heisman Trophy, even though everyone was already saying Tua had it locked up. We both made a I think a legitimate argument, and I think Dwayne Haskins did as well. That has fallen off. J.K. Dobbins was a guy at the beginning of the season. I thought, you know what? He might be a Heisman sleeper. That has fallen off. And then this defense I thought was going to be just something of wonders, and that has fallen off. Because this past Saturday, they allowed 51 points Mm. to Maryland. And then I thought that K.J. Hill was going to be a legitimate contender for the Blitnikoff Award, and that has fallen off. So are they a top 10 team? Yes. Are they going to compete for a, a college football playoff position? No. Are they going to complete, compete with Michigan? Probably because it's a rivalry game, but that's as far as I'm going to go there because I just, I'm just i starting to lose a lot of faith in Ohio State because the teams, and I mentioned this about them earlier, when they play an inferior team, they get the win convincingly. And that ended at TCU. And now you see them play Iowa. You see them play, um, well, you saw them lost to Purdue. And then you see them play Maryland, and everything's kind of, fallen off they're playing inferior teams and they're not winning the way that they should i wouldn't even go as far as to say they're gonna compete with michigan even if that's a little bit of a pick spoiler i mean you just look at what they've done since that purdue loss 49 against purdue they allow 31 points against nebraska they sure they beat michigan state by 20 all of a sudden they don't look like the world's greatest team and then 51 points to a five win maryland team and i know maryland beat texas at the beginning of the year i know this game was on the road But Ohio State, I mean, like you said, they just don't have it. They have borderline no defense. Even if Nick Bosa was still playing, he would not take 30 points off the board in these Ohio State games. Dwayne Haskins had a good game this week, and I'm not, you know, I don't think there's any arguing that. He put up six total touchdowns. But the defense is not there, and that's the reason. That's what's going to hold Ohio State back. They simply just don't have it on the defensive side of the ball this year. And if they can't stop a team like Maryland or a team like Purdue or a team like Nebraska— I don't think there's much of an argument that they should be in the college football playoff, even if they win the Big Ten. The only thing I'd say is if they somehow beat Michigan convincingly. But with the way Ohio State's falling and the way Michigan's trending, I think it's a long shot. I don't really think rankings, schedule, results matter going into this weekend for really any team. And I'm going to say that for this game specifically. Because it doesn't matter how good you are, how bad you are, how many players you have hurt, how many, whatever. It's Michigan, Ohio State. It does not matter. The streaks you're on, the result, anything, nothing matters. And this is at Ohio State. It's at the Horseshoe. One of, if not the toughest place to play in college football. Granted, you say the same thing about the big house, and it's whatever. This game upcoming does not matter about this past week. I think it was a rough couple weeks for Ohio State, don't get me wrong, ever since that Purdue game has sort of been downhill for them. They're still performing very well, but not as well as they should be and not as well as they should be going into this Michigan game. Well, this definitely helps the hype for the Ohio State-Michigan game because if Ohio State loses this game, they probably fall to 15, 16, 17. But with how the playoff committee is, who knows, maybe they fall to 12 or 13 just because they want to keep Ohio State there. Yeah, they'll stay at le- top 10. At least now, Ohio State's going to be ranked most likely in the top 10. Michigan's going to be ranked there number 4. And it's going to lot. It's gonna have a lot more implications on the line. But the, the my takeaway from this game is, yeah, Ohio State gets the lucky win, but Anthony McFarland, I, the first thing I did was... I went to see if anyone owned him for college football fantasy, and boys, he's still on waivers. Not that it really matters for any of you guys. Potentially for me it does, but he has 300 rushing yards and two touchdowns. He had like 150 yards with a few minutes left in the first quarter. This guy was unstoppable in Ohio State. Lyle mentioned it with with, with Bosa. If they had Bosa, there wouldn't be any difference. This, This defense just is not that good, but Anthony McFarland, they just had no 
answer for him. And it was the game was just going back and forth overall. I was I was kind of bummed that McFarland didn't break the 300 yard mark. He was two yards short, but. Yeah, I mean, this is just, it was a great game. Maryland's a good team, and Ohio State, they're they're just really, really lucky that, like I said, that uh, the Maryland didn't convert there because if they do, Ohio State's season is completely shattered. Urban Meyer looked like he was going to explode on the sideline. He looked like he aged about 10 years in that game. That, w- that was some of our Q&A questions where it was like this week, how uncomfortable is Urban Meyer going to make America feel every time they pat him on the, they showed him on the sideline? Because every time they cut to him, it's like he was just getting ready to go take a number two or something, or if he just had some like bad fondue. I, I don't know what was going on, but something was up with him because I, I was, I, I looked he looks uncomfortable, and I was feeling uncomfortable from my, my, my nice couch. I don't know what it was. Hopefully, he, hopefully he's able to feel better. But so I, I, one, one team that is going to be feeling better, guys, is Oklahoma State, arguably the best five-loss team in the country. We talked about Iowa State weeks ago being like that one team that always plays spoiler. Mm. That is good fun, dude. Perfect. I love how it only took you about 30 seconds to get it. I was hoping... <laughs> I wanted to make sure there wasn't an ad before. Hopefully for everyone listening, they got that Anchorman reference. But Oklahoma State, they uh, played spoiler this weekend. They com- well, At the beginning of the season, I had West Virginia in my top four. West Virginia. Okay, turn that. That is the worst song ever created. That's my hot take. If you're listening to the show right now, I want to know what your thoughts are on the West Virginia song. because I, I hope you lose subscribers. I personally hate that song with a passion. I, I cannot stand it. But... I I'm unsubscribed. I had. Uh, are you even I subscribed? Even, I'm not. Blake, I've been subscribed <laughs> since 2012. Oh, that's. Thank you, Josh. I had West Virginia. I regret in, everything. I had West Virginia in my top four coming into the season, and it looked like that was going to be a somewhat good pick. But now, uh, Oklahoma, or, yeah, Oklahoma State, they ruined any West Virginia chances. I believe West Virginia is still alive, though, in the Big 12 title game, so that's good for them. But West Virginia, your title hopes are shot, and that's because you allow 21 points. In the fourth quarter to Oklahoma State, we talked about this guy last week, but Taylor Cornelius, he only had 338 passing yards, guys, but he did have five touchdowns. He ran one in, and Oklahoma State, this receiving core they have, one of the more slept on ones in the country, because I think it was last week, it was Ty, or Tyron Walls, or was it Tylen Walls? Or, Tylen, yeah. or Tyron Johnson, I should say, that went off. And this week, Dylan Stoner, nine catches, 127 yards. He's like the number one guy. Oklahoma State... We didn't show them enough love last week. We all picked West Virginia, but this is an Oklahoma State team that just they're – they're a scary good team in West Virginia. That that fourth quarter, they just couldn't hold them. Up 31-14 at the half. They don't score in the third quarter, and they came out firing. And Will Greer, I, I kind of thought that he had Heisman hopes coming into this this week. Not, not that there was many, but I, I kind of had him at my number two on my list. His Heisman hopes are shattered if there still were any, and – Oklahoma State, you just ruined a team season. Good for you guys. Yeah, I, I thought that I really thought West Virginia was going to score on that final possession, especially the play before um, they end up losing the game was that what thirty-five yard pass on that seam route down the near sideline. I, I was, I thought they were going to score. Um, but here's the thing: it, it's it's actually really good to see Oklahoma State get this win because you look at some of their losses this season. I mean, they lost to Iowa State by a touchdown. They got killed by Texas Tech, but we're going to forget about that one. But they lose to Iowa State by a touchdown, and then they lose to Baylor by four. They lose to Oklahoma by one. I don't think there's an argument here, Blake. I think they are the best 5-5 five and five team in college football because of their offense. And th- this was a typical Big 12 shootout type of game. Um, and-, and Cornelius, there's... There's been some weeks where I think, all right, he looks really good. There's been some weeks where I think, eh, he's not, he's nothing special. This was one of those weeks where he was efficient when he when he needed to be, and he threw for chunk yardage. And that's what this team did so well against West Virginia late in the game, able to score points, was because they knew that there was no more running the football anymore. They needed to start opening up the playbook. But throughout most of the game, their offensive attack was pretty balanced. I thought they ran the ball well. I thought that Cornelius ran the ball well. He had and then, over 100 yards. Yeah, he had over 100 yards rushing. But And then I thought that their passing game was great in the fourth quarter when it needed to be. But the good part is they're able to get a win against a very good West Virginia team. And I still think West Virginia is going to obviously compete in conference. They'll, they'll go to a good bowl game. But they essentially ruined any playoff hopes that the Mountaineers had. But the good part about that is Oklahoma State has been in so many games this season, games where they probably could have won. These last two games for them against Oklahoma and West Virginia, they look like for sure blowout losses, and they made both of them interesting. And 
they take down West Virginia and they lose to Oklahoma by one because they opted to go for a two-point conversion that probably should have been completed. There is no reason for this team to hang its head over its season. I was so surprised that this team went for almost 270 yards on the ground this week with no Justice Hill. I mean, this kid Chuba yeah. Hubbard had 134 yards of his own. But you look at these two. You look at Cornelius and you look at Tylen Wallace. We know the Big 12 is filled with high-powered offenses. The Big 12 has some of the strongest quarterback wide receiver duos in the in the country, in the conference, you name it. You look at guys like Kyler and Hollywood, that's the obvious one. Uh, Antoine Wesley and Alan Bowman. Will Greer, David Sills. This one right here for Oklahoma State. They might be a five-loss team, but Cornelius and Tylen Wallace, they're right up there for the best quarterback receiver duo in the Big 12 conference. I mean, they're half the reason I'd say this team's even won six games with the way the connection they have and, and the way they've been able to just put up points on the board at will. And I think they have a very underrated duo of running backs, too, with with Hill and uh, Hubbard. Because Hubbard, I felt like his coming out game was, was kind of against OU, where late in the game they start relying on him a little bit more, especially on that last drive. And I remember thinking, okay, who in the world is this Hubbard guy? And I looked him up, and then his stats up to that point were all right. And he'd obviously seen action f- throughout most of the season. But then when you see Hill, um, when he comes out of the game and Hubbard comes in, they even use him. Okay, I think Hubbard's kind of like an Alvin Kamara type guy where if you need him to go out of the backfield and set up as a receiver, he can do it because he can catch passes as well, which is why I think that this running back tandem that Oklahoma State has is very easily slept on, especially in the Big 12 because Oklahoma's got a really good duo of running backs as well. Well, the thing about the, the run game was because I have Justice Hill on my fantasy team and about 1.15, 15 minutes before kickoff, I noticed that he was out. They just listed him out like an hour before the game. And I said, who's next on the depth chart? And I looked up and it was Chubba Hubbard. I was going to pick him up, but I had no room. But yeah, you mentioned next guy up where he's he's, he's the backup to Justice Hill. He steps in, runs for 134 yards. I think last week he had like 200 yards with a couple touchdowns. So very, very impressive run game to go along with their passing and uh, receiving game as well. And I think we, I think we like, oh yeah, I think we got like a phone call or something right now, but we can't hear from BK's end. So he's shielding the phone call right now. So I guess while he does that, we're just going to continue or I should say move on to the next game, and that is, well, game, if you want to say. And that's Syracuse and Notre Dame. Brady, what, what's going on? Uh, all good. Someone just called in for the Q&A, but I told him to tweet oh. to us or call back later. Ah, oh, fantastic. So whoever it was, shout out to you for being ready in that. But we're going we're gonna to open up the phone lines in about 30 minutes, though, so it's fine. We'll, we'll give you the, the line for that. But, yeah, I said game, but it, it wasn't really a game because Notre Dame won 36-3. to now, in defense, in defense, now I'll let Lyle give his two cents. Eric Dungy, Syracuse's you know star quarterback, which by the way, he has tied in college football. I, I forget who it was with. I want to say maybe like Nick Fitzgerald, but Eric Dungy for his career has 18 games with at least a passing touchdown or rushing touchdown. So he's tied with 18. Only throws four passes before he goes down. I think the I, I didn't hear what the final diagnosis was, but it looked like it was like a back injury. He just he got hit on a play, went up to the line of scrimmage, and kind of just like collapsed. So he was only out there for uh, four plays. And then Tommy DeVito, what a great name, especially a very New Yorker name. I'm not sure if he's from New York, but that's a very New Yorker name. Tommy DeVito comes in and he's just god awful because I mean, he's the backup at Syracuse. No offense to Syracuse, but yeah, not not the best. And Notre Dame just runs away with the game. I mean, they were dominant the entire way. Their defense was fantastic, but Syracuse is one of the highest scoring teams in the country. I think they're averaging like 44 points a game. Syracuse had one of the better defenses in the game, and Notre Dame just made them look like they need to go back to referring to them as a basketball school. Tommy DeVito from Cedar Grove, New Jersey, so close close to New York. Very good. That's good enough. Better, in my opinion. All right, Lyle, you got a 33-point win. At this point in the schedule, it's Notre Dame's second, you know, toughest team they've had to play. How impressed were you by the Irish, and do you think they've solidified themselves as one of the two or three best teams in the country now? I mean, I think it's hard not to be impressed. I mean, I'll say this. For, for people that weren't putting respect on Notre Dame before, I feel like this win should solidify it for most of those people. Now, granted, I know Dungy got hurt. Having said that, he didn't look fantastic that first quarter of the game before he went out, but... When you look at Notre Dame's resume as a whole at this point, they've beaten a top 15 team in Syracuse, and they pretty much dismantled them. They have a huge win over Michigan, and now they have wins over ranked Northwestern and potentially ranked Pitt. The AP poll has them ranked. We'll see if the committee does this week. 
But those are two teams that are going to be playing for a conference title. So now all of a sudden, while we thought the big wins or potential games could be Stanford and USC, some of these other teams have proven that they're, they're forces to be reckoned with. But back to the Irish, I think for people that are still harping on those early games of the season, now I know they got the win against Michigan, but I'm talking those first four games before Book and Williams really took over. I, uh, I don't want to say throw it out, but... Focus more on what's at hand now and how they're trending now because they're they're clearly proven that they are one of the top four teams in the country. They're clearly proving that they can take on just about any team. And we'll see what happens next week. But, I mean, this is a team, again, you play a top 12 team and you pretty much beat them into the ground. So that's what I really like to see out of them, especially since they've had this problem losing late a lot of previous years under Brian Kelly. They kind of put that to rest this past week. Yeah, and I think I think of all things, this this win um, solidifies them as a legitimate playoff contender, especially when you face off with a very potent offense that Syracuse has. And yes, Eric Dungey goes down, um, and he's been one of the most efficient quarterbacks so far this season, especially under the ACC. But the fact that quarterback goes down, and then they they hold Syracuse to three points, and those three points come on the last play of the game. Or essentially the last play. It was the last play, wasn't it? Was it was like with 10 seconds, I yeah. think Lyle so, said. So they were like inside the 10. It yeah. was fourth down. And Dino Babers decides to send his field goal unit out and, and kick the <laughs> field goal awesome. to just put points on the board. And he almost missed it, too. Like he, I like it. Eh, why not? Like put, it. put points on the board. Why not? For, I would have gone for the score. I thought they were going to. But you know what? Hey, it happens. Why yeah. not put some points on the board? Yeah, and I, and I don't see any reason why why Notre Dame should be kept out of the conversation of these top three teams in the country up, up to this point. Um, for Syracuse, though, I, I don't really know where their season goes from here. You know, I mean, they've they, they've played well. They have some really close wins. But now that they played a, a top ten team, and a lot of people were thinking, okay, so now Syracuse is going to get this, this real test similar to Boston College a couple weeks ago with Clemson. How, how are they going to perform? And they perform the way they did and now where does that leave them where was boston college left after the clemson game where is syracuse going to be left after this game against notre dame it'll be interesting to see where the rest of this season goes from from this point on and that's why i think the syracuse boston college game this saturday is very interesting all of a sudden it, it definitely it definitely will be now we got one final game that happened now it was a very very nice game by washington state they they won 69 to 28. They scored 55 points in the first half. That that is unbelievable. 55 points against U of A. Now, in previous weeks, I've kind of been hesitant on Washington State. I've you know I've thought they're they're the best team in the Pac-12, but I think they they're too high at eight. I'm a, like U of A is not a great team. They're definitely better in the second half than they were in the first half. But to put up 69 points, win by 40. I'm officially sold on Washington State, and I'm officially sold on Gardner Minshew being at least a top three finish in the Heisman. At least. Seven touchdowns, nearly 500 yards. It, Minshew mania is alive and well, and I think Washington State is legit. I believe it. Yeah, I, I think if you look at the teams in the top ten right now, um, or at least the teams that we expect would be in the top ten right now, gotta be honest, I think they're the weak link. Um, if... This is going to get a lot of flack. I would throw, if if we're putting UCF in the top 10, I think there are two teams that would have some, some trouble really competing with the other eight, and I think it's UCF and Washington State. But I think that both of those teams are legitimate top 10 teams. There's nobody else that I would put ahead of them. So, and then, and then you look at what Gardner Minshew's done, and Minshew Mania is in full effect. I'll be honest, Blake, I think Minshew has made a a good enough argument to be considered a Heisman front runner. Oh, I why not? The dude threw for seven touchdowns and nearly five hundred yards this week. And yes, they're playing against U of A. Yes, he played almost the entire game well up by forty points. But this guy's insane, and it is beyond me how USC beat this Washington State team. I have no words to describe it. So, did you guys know that Minshew was originally committed to Bama? No, nope. was he actually? Yeah, and then Mike Leach told him, "Well, do you want to be a backup at Bama, or do you want to lead the the nation in passing yards at Wazoo?" Why does that not surprise anybody? Yeah. So look, in t- uh, first off, just quickly on the Washington State game, yeah, I mean they're they're taking care of just about everybody they're playing these days. Outside of that close win at Cal, I mean they 
win by 24 at Colorado. They have the huge week this week. They beat Oregon by two touchdowns. I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to do, and they've only got one loss. But back to Minshew, I mean, yeah, I, I think to say that he could really win it over Tua might be a little bit far-fetched. However, you look at what Minshew's done this year. I mean, my goodness. Here's a couple of stats for you. He leads the nation in passing yards. That can't be a surprise. He leads the nation in completion percentage per game. Leads the nation in total offense. Tied for first in passing touchdowns. Second among Power 5 quarterbacks in completion percentage behind only Ian Book. I mean, what does this guy have more to prove on his resume? I mean, the whole reason Washington State is 8 is because of that man right there. Minshew Mania himself. I mean, that defense is subpar. I'm not going to lie. But Gardner Minshew has led them to a 10-win season and potentially might lead them to a Pac-12 title. And, and will they get in? Will they not get into the top four? I think they need a decent amount of outside help. But they've they put themselves on the map this year, and it's because of Minshew. Minshew, if Washington State beats UW this Saturday in the Apple Cup, and they go to the Pac-12 championship, regardless of whether or not they win or lose, if they go, I think they'll win, I think they'll beat Utah. If they go and they win, there is no reason for Minshew not to finish top two in the Heisman voting. And additionally, I'll... I'll refer back to the point that I always make. The Heisman Trophy should go to a player who, if you take them off of their respective team, that it is a completely different team. And if you take Gardner Minshew off of Washington State, they are not a top 10 team. They are not a top 25 football team. They are 100% irrelevant. I would, I would give them five wins. They are a five-loss team. Yeah. At least. At least. I'd give them five wins If you wins take Tua Minshew. off of Alabama, Alabama's undefeated. Josh, you said uh, Apple Cup's on a Friday night, by the way. A Friday night Oops. in Pullman. Yeah. That's great. Looking at this Gardner Minshew, you saw he was originally committed to East Carolina. His offer No, he played at East Carolina. I know. Oh, okay. He was That's originally he, committed to Bama. He where no no no. Like original, original. Oh, okay. Very oh. first college stop was originally East Carolina. His offers coming out of high school were East Carolina, Buffalo, Florida A and M, Southeast Missouri State, and Tennessee Martin. And now he's leading a top ten team, possibly to the Rose Bowl, possibly, possibly to the to the championship race, to the playoffs, to whatever. You don't see many players do that kind of growth in a span of three years, because he's a graduate transfer now. He's in his fourth year of college football. You don't see players doing that, and somehow. This random guy with a mustache has been doing it all season long, week after week after week. Well, my first question is, I mean, people, there's got to be at least 15 quarterbacks in college football that have a mustache. Yeah. Every, everyone's acting as if this is like brand new. This has never happened before. Are you telling me there's not one that's got a nice mustache in college so, football? So the Gardner Minshew mustache, I don't know. I'm not sure if you guys know why he has it. His dad his is dad a has. huge yeah. Burt Reynolds fan. Yeah. And so him and his dad had matching mustaches to, after Burt Reynolds died earlier this year, they grew out their mustache like Burt Reynolds. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, if he's going to have his toughest toughest game of the year this upcoming week against Washington. I mean, that, that has a chance to kind of be his Heisman moment. If he can beat UW in convincing fashion, still, I, I still think, well, I think two was... His lead is not as big as it was. I think it's still his to lose, which is, I think, That's tough, fair. tough with one game left. But if Gardner Minshew is able to come out, put up 400 yards, a couple touchdowns against Washington. And think, Utah. Don't forget about the Pac-12 championship and, if he wins. But isn't is, does does the voting conclude no. at the end of the— No, no, the conference championship counts. Remember Trey Mason before does. the bowl game. I was going to say, okay. remember Trey Mason in the SEC championship ah. when he put up, like, five touchdowns and then okay, he got invited? So if he's able to beat Washington and if he's able to beat Utah in convincing fashion, I, I think he'll have a legitimate argument to win the Heisman, which is shocking, which is unbelievable because, as, as Josh mentioned, somehow if they don't just blow that game to SC, this team's undefeated right now and maybe he is the Heisman front runner. So Gardner Minshew, that is going to be an exciting, exciting game this Friday night. But hold on. Even if you go back and you look at that USC game, he threw for 344 yards and three touchdowns. I mean, he still had a fantastic game against USC, and they lost. And I think that's because that was the one good USC performance all season long. The, the Heisman's going to be awarded December 9th this year. 
Okay. Yeah, so there's, so, so that is, that's right after the conference championship, that's, is it not? Right. That's, so the conference champions is like November 30th, December 1st weekend. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then after, then before Bulls start, the first Bull game's on December 15th. But without question, he should be invited to New York. That's that's so slam dunk. Well, looking yeah. at our Twitter responses right now, we asked where uh, you fans would have Gardner Minshew in your Heisman discussion. Peter says third. Now, I don't think it's your Peter, Josh. I think it's a, it's another okay. another Peter. Scott Nicholson says second behind Tua, he actually has his list right here. He goes Tua, Minshew, Greer, and then Haskins. Andrew Coster says third behind Tua and Kyler. So everyone kind of agrees that he's going to be top three. It's just a matter of would you have him at second, would you have him at third. But that pretty much wraps up the games from this past weekend. But before we go to the AP poll, just one shout out to the Citadel. You guys, you know, you, you look at the box score, you guys lost by 30. Well, first of all, you guys covered the spread. So major props to you. You guys were, I think, 52 and a half or 51 and a half point underdogs. At halftime, the Citadel and Bama were tied, and the world almost came crashing down. They had a chance to take the lead. They had a 40-yard field goal that went in. They were called for like a false start, then they missed the 45-yarder, and then things just, you know, went in Alabama's favor. But Citadel, shout out to you guys. I think this was the first time all season long Bama was tied or losing at halftime. I think it's the first time all year they've probably been tied that wasn't zero to zero in all honesty i i would not be shocked by that so the citadel shout out to you guys you guys probably lost las vegas a lot of money but guys let's go to the ap poll it's been a while since we paid a visit to the good old ap poll now i'm looking at this ap poll and i kind of like it i i i kind of like it they got wazoo here at seven they have ucf technically tied with lsu at eight but We'll give we'll give UCF the benefit of the doubt. We'll put them at eight instead of LSU. Now, of course, these rankings are going to be a little different once the playoff ones come out. But I think one through ten, the eight people has this. They have it spot on. I I was going to say the same thing. Like I made my own list of what I think my top ten teams would be before I looked at the AP poll today, and yeah, mine's exactly what the AP poll had themselves. I mean, I I gave UCF the benefit of the doubt and had them at eight because, like we've talked about with LSU. They've peaked. Like, they, they can't get any higher with one game remaining and no SEC title appearance. But everything else I like. I mean, I think the top four is pretty solidified. Georgia, Oklahoma, that's exactly what the committee has, too. Washington State at seven. They absolutely deserve to move up a spot after the win today. And UCL, UCF, LSU, Ohio State, I think they just about hit it right on the head. Yeah, I mean, mine's pretty much the same. I do have LSU and UCF swapped. Um, but other than that, I think everything's uh, right where it should be. I think there really isn't much discretion that you can do for this because the top six, seven isn't going to change. I think for what you for what the eight people has, the only discretionary part would be that eight dash A slash B spot, the eight nine position with else with LSU UCF. But I give the benefit of the doubt to UCF because you know ten and zero, and it's UCF national champs. No. There you go. Now, now you, easily you can make the argument that LSU, are they like the sixth or seventh best team in the country? Sure you can. You Probably. can argue that there may be a top five team in the country. But at this point in the season, I, I've been saying this for weeks and Lyle just mentioned it, there's no reason to have them at seven when, one, they don't have an SEC title game, so they have one game left this upcoming week. They have no chance of making the college football playoff. And I think it's just going to make things more difficult where if you have them, let's say, over a Washington State who... Probably doesn't, but they still technically have a chance to make the college football playoff. It's going to make it harder for them to jump over a spot. Or like in Ohio State, where if Ohio State, they come and beat Michigan this week, and then they beat Northwestern, they still have a chance. But if they're there at 10, it's going to be tough to move six spots in two weeks. Well, can we revert back to Washington State for a second? Because in terms of their chances, I was thinking about what has to happen for them to somehow sneak into this thing. And I don't think it's like too crazy. It'd be tough. But it's not too crazy because if I have this right, what I think needs to happen is obviously, first and foremost, they need to win out. Ohio State needs to beat Michigan next week. Oklahoma needs to lose one of their next two games. If those three things happen, oh, and, and if Georgia beat or if Alabama beats Georgia, which I think will happen, if those things all occur, I mean, it's possible. It's it's definitely possible. We'll have to see if Ohio State they give them the benefit of the doubt over Washington State and and how they play all that out. But they're not out of, you know, they're not done yet. It's going to be tough, but I don't think they're done. I completely agree. So it's going to be interesting to see. At, at this point, um, these are really the only rankings that really matter because all these other ones, you know, they have no chance. It's just a matter of who's going to get the uh, New Year's Six Bowl. But after beating Cincinnati, guys, I'm going to propose this question to you. Cincinnati, who's a very good team in the American Conference, they were like number one and two for like offense and defense, ranked number 24. 
Obviously, UCF's not going to get any top four love, but if you were voting right now for the College Football Playoff Committee, where would you put UCF in your rankings? I'd put them at nine. Yeah, anywhere from eight to ten, I'd say, is pretty reasonable. I have been eight. I, I, I would have, have them at either nine or ten. I, I think they need to get a love. I, I think this is a team that's really good. I'm, I'm excited to see who they get matched up with. And they're, Do you think uh, you're be- they're better than last year's UCF team? I don't think they're better than last year's. It's, it's tough to really say. I think last year's UCF team, as it, it, surprising as this sounds, last year's UCF team was in more of a spotlight than this year's. Because it was week after week that they were surprising people. Like, oh, is UCF a real team? Well, yeah, well, yeah they, they won. Oh, they, they won again. So they just kept being that national spotlight team, whereas now everyone's saying, ha-ha, UCF national champion, and just sort of shrugging it off, yeah. not getting the actual the, the spotlight that they did last year. So it's going to be interesting to see, but shout out to UCF. But yeah, the playoff rankings, those are going to come out in two days, and we're going to have to wait and see, but I'm very excited to see. But for the most part, I mean, we can expect the top six is going to stay the exact same. Washington State, LSU, they might move, but who who, who really knows? Now, we talked about it a few minutes ago, but I'm just going to bring it up one more time. That's just the Heisman talk. Now, obviously, Tua isn't as much of a front runner, front runner as he was a few weeks ago, but he still kind of is. So I'm just going to ask you guys, maybe your top three, maybe your top four, but who are the guys you think still realistically have a chance of winning the Heisman? Well, my order one through four, like you said, we kind of dove into it a little bit earlier, but my order goes Tua, Minshew, Kyler, and then Will Greer. Yeah, I've got, I've got Tua and Gardner Minshew, and that's it. Mm. Uh, I have Tua... Gardner and I like Kyler still. I got two at one. I got Kyler at two, but then I got uh, I got good old Gardner Minshew at three. But it's still open. I, we're gonna have to wait and see. Maybe hopefully there's a little more that can happen this week to make it a little more interesting for everyone because it's kind of been assumed that it was gonna be two for the past month. So we can have some of these guys have some good games this upcoming week, make it a little interesting. Have us watching the Heisman presentation, wondering. Yeah, is it, is it going to be someone other than Tua? Is there a chance? So I guess Josh's camera just went out, so he's over there fixing it. But we are going to transition now into Blake's bets. We have a little bit of news, but we're going to talk about the news after Blake's bets. There we go. And cut perfect. Oh, turn that off. Just to throw that at you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, BK. This week for Blake's bets, I was two for five. There were some, some very tough ones. Georgia UMass. Georgia only beat UMass by about 30 points. That was even a Q&A last week, and I thought Georgia was actually going to win by about 50, but they didn't. I was 2 for 5 this week. On the year, I was 29 for 60, and it's it's unfortunate news, guys. There are no Blake Spets to make this week that because because it's so early in the week, the spreads haven't come That's out yet. That's true. The I, I, will, I will say this. Ohio State has been the favorite in 51 straight games. That streak could come to an end this week. And I think it will. Now, now, Blake, um, what is more disappointing for you? One, that um, you don't get to make any Blake's bets in your Blake's bets segment. Or two, that you might have to find something else to put over me talking for the last, like, 30 minutes. Because I don't know what's going on with the camera. Hmm. Well... We'll I guess, figure that out. I guess we'll have to wait and see. What, what were you going to say, Brady? Uh, it looks o- good now. It's opened up that Ohio Ohio State's a three-and-a-half point underdog. Huh. Ah. <laughs> Interesting. Mm-hmm. We have to wait and see if the streak comes to an end. But unfortunately, no Blake's bets so, so is that this mean, week. Is this the last edition of Blake's bets, or are you going to go some some bowl game Blake's bets or championship game Blake's bets? Yeah, we, we might. We because might. if so, you finished under 500. I'll, ma- I'll make sure we oh. get a few more <laughs> the rest of the season. Hey. We got Army Navy coming up, and I'm sure yes. we can get. I think like Stanford and Cal have to play each other again, mm-hmm. so there's still a chance to get over 500 for the year. Now, if you want to make some Blake spats, go on over to the link in the description of this video on usebovada.com, and Bovada will give you 50 percent of whatever your first deposit is. So go over there, make some bets, and uh, have some fun. Not now, a paid bo- advertisement. Not, not a paid advertisement. By not Bovada. a paid advertisement by Bovada. We just hear the Harry's Highlight Show. We we love Bovada. Now, before we transition. Into the Q&A, we have some coaching news. Now, usually right. we, we don't have coaching news unless a coach was just fired or something like you that. Don't. Now, this isn't a firing bit of news. This is a bit of hiring oh. a bit of news. And former LSU head coach and I guess current turned actor, 
Le- uh, actor. Doctor. Doctor. He's. Do- face of Dr. Face, Pepper. No, but he's he's actually in some like low budget movie that's coming out. Is it like Shark really? Seven? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what he's in, but Les, Les Miles, Miles the, IMDb. The Eater of Grass. He is the new head coach of Kansas football. He has an IMDb page. There you go. He has an IMDb <laughs> page. So he's officially an actor. Les Miles is the new coach of Kansas. Now this is a a very interesting move because I think Les Miles this pre this offseason I think he kind of just chose to not. There were plenty of head coaching jobs that he could have taken. A lot of he, mm-hmm. any head coaching job would have been better than Kansas. He decides to go to Kansas. So I guess the question is why? <laughs> why? Imagine you're the guy that turns it around. That That's my thing. I think that's what he wants and to do. W- when I saw Les Miles to Kansas, I saw rumored last week that Todd Graham to Kansas. I'm like, all right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Les Miles to Kansas, I was like, that doesn't make sense unless they're offering him some John Gruden amount of money. Well, he's on a, I believe it's five years, like $13.5 million contract. That's a good amount of money. That's... Yeah, two and a half to uh, twenty two point seven five million a year is what it is. About two million less than his salary was at LSU, but he's coaching again, and he's the guy that can turn Kansas around. Asterix could. I have a hard time understanding the move. I think it's fairly strange that of all the jobs he could have possibly taken. This is the job that Les Miles took, the Kansas job, especially since the Jayhawks haven't had a winning record since two thousand and eight. They haven't been really that relevant since 2007, and that was that team with Chris Harris and Aqib Tlaib. Mm-hmm. So, and, and not only do I find it weird for Les Miles, actually, to be honest, now that he took this Kansas job, I wonder if that rumor back last year was maybe somewhat true that he was actually interested in Oregon State. Because we said it was crazy at first, but, but now if he's going to take a job like Kansas, maybe it wasn't so crazy. But not only so much with Les Miles taking the job – I almost find it interesting that this is the guy that Kansas wanted. Because don't get me wrong, Les Miles is a good coach, and he had some really good years at LSU. But Les Miles is a defensive-minded coach. And in the Big 12, what wins you games? Not defense. It's putting up points. And Les Miles was never a guy that had these high-powered offenses that put up a whole ton of points. And that's what Kansas needs right now. So look, you can recruit defensive guys all you want, but if you're facing... The, the likes of Kyler Murray and Taylor Cornelius and Will Greer, they're just going to pick defenses apart every week? I, I don't know how much that does for Kansas. It, Les Miles, it worked for a job like LSU, but I'm not so, so sold that it's going to work for a Big 12 job. So Kansas Athletic Director Jeff Long, I don't know if you guys saw this, he was like scheduling and put out a bunch of different flight plans to mess with the media because like I don't know if you guys know this but like media will like track flights to be like oh where's a player going like when Le'Veon was in Miami and flying back to Pittsburgh people were tracking his flight the whole LeBron where was LeBron going they were tracking his flight so Jeff Long put out like four or five different flight plans with like private jet just like scheduling them not paying for them, but like scheduling them just to be like oh from all these different locations who are we gonna hire so it's all a chess match and Lyle like you said he has to recruit some big players. Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but Kansas for 2019, their football recruiting class has one commit. Ooh. And it is a three-star running back. That's usually not From good. Wentzville, Missouri. How Cole are they Mueller. still FBS, honestly? Yeah. We've been over it. I, it's an interesting move, but I think Les Miles, he just wants to be known as the guy that turned that program around because they're historically bad. They're historically one of the worst, you know, college football programs we've seen the last few decades. And yeah, I think he wants to be the guy that can do it. And I, I, I generally think that he can because he's still a brand name, one of the more recognizable names in college football. You got all these guys now that are going to be interested in Kansas because of Les Miles being the head coach. Now, I don't think next year they're going to win, you know, seven or eight games. But I think next year, they might have another year like this. They win four, maybe five. But starting in like 2020, I think this is going to be a team that's going to be getting around eight wins, maybe nine. And who knows, maybe in two or three or four years, they're going to be competing in the Big 12 again. But do you think they can put up points? That's my biggest question. Because Les Miles has never been a big offensive guy. If, if he's able to recruit, recruit well, I think he'll be able to. But a very interesting move. The 2018 recruiting class, their freshman now for Kansas, they had 23 uh, players commit and enroll. They had four, uh, three, I'm sorry, three four stars, a defensive and a cornerback, mm-hmm. and an all purpose offensive player. So interesting. They have some weapons, just don't know how they're going to use them. And before we transition into the QA, we do have, I want to share with you guys, we have Matt's bets. 
my good old uncle is listening right now and he has some bets that he would like to share with you guys and the viewers now oh perf perfect right there now although the spreads and the lines aren't out yet he is saying to take the irish with whatever it is yeah. <laughs> so he doesn't, he doesn't even know what the spread is yet, but he's saying if you want to make money, Irish take, by take the Irish by whatever it is. Another yeah. one, Michigan with whatever it is. So Uncle Matt is really high on Michigan, and he's really high on Notre Dame. And Uncle Matt, he's uh, he does pretty well for himself when yeah, it comes so, to those bets, doesn't he? So if you're listening, he, Uncle Matt knows what's up. Is he so a bet hunter or just a, he, he a knows, storage hunter? He knows the, oh, he's, oh, he's a storage hunter as well, him and, him and Papa Harris. Speaking of which, we need to we need to watch some storage wars soon, get, guys. We need to get one of them on the show. We need to get them both on the show. Hey, if they're listening right now, which I think they are, maybe we can get them to call in in a bit. Have we'll them have, text you and give them the number early. We'll have we'll have to wait and see. So if they want to call in, perfect. But um, we are going to transition now into the Q and A. While a question I have is what is going on with Josh's camera, but I don't think that's an answer that anyone has the answer to. So if you're listening live right now I'm and you want to rage, and you want this happened like it was our very first episode we did in studio, I think this year, guys, where my camera was like spazzing out and not working. So if you're listening to the show live right now and you want to call in and ask us a question, the phone number is six zero two four nine six. Here we go. Five one five six. I'm ready for you. 602-496-5156. Ask us a question, and let's get things underway, guys. Gage Martins wants to know, do you wish the Heisman didn't rely so much on team success? I, I kind of do, because like while team success often is, is the first factor, I, I think in a sense, like I don't think rankings should be the end all be all because there's team there, there's these guys in the you know in the F not the FBS but the group of five you can look at guys like Cole McDonald like Devin Singletary who do so well for themselves and just light it up every week but they're never in the national spotlight because they're not playing any big name matchups but that that's not really on them so do I think two is a Heisman do I think you know win should be a huge factor of course but I think there's more things that go into it than just wins yeah agreed I think that sums it up yeah Pretty much. You took the words right out of my mouth. Edgar Martinez wants to know, if you were a five-star recruit, what school would you commit to? Kansas. Kansas. <laughs> nah, I uh, mean, it's, if I was a five-star recruit, there would be a lot of factors, obviously. Um, but, I mean, my top choice would be uh, ASU or USC, baby. Yeah, it's, it's hard not to say ASU or Notre Dame. If I was a five-star recruit, honestly, I might say... ASU, because if you're that talented, and not to say ASU is not a good college football school, but they're not a blue blood college football school, where if you're a five star and you come into ASU, you're probably going to see the field pretty quick. Yeah. I, I've, I've visited Oregon and those facilities they have there. I, I know how it's so easy for them to recruit. Although I don't like the cold weather and I don't like the rain. I think Oregon would get my vote. I was going to say the same thing for Oregon. Really? Yeah, either Oregon. I feel like going to the U would be really cool, too. Miami, Miami, yeah. or maybe like a Florida State. Because you got no, you can't go wrong going to Florida. See, but that's another thing about Oregon. People people single out Oregon because of Nike and because of their uniforms. And you see all of like the it, – it's like it's almost like an urban legend. Like, oh, like what does what is, what is Oregon's locker room look like? And then you look it up and you see how great it is. You guys realize that a lot of these like – like blue blood college football programs have insane facilities. Like, I, I, yes. like, I feel like Texas I would go to Texas. Has insane I feel like facility. I'd go to Clemson just because they have the slide in their locker room or like in their facility. Oh, the too. big slide. Yeah, I, I love it. But now we got Thomas from North Carolina on with us right now. Thomas, how are you doing over there? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? We are doing fantastic. Thanks for tuning in on Sunday night. And uh, what question do you have for us this week, Thomas? My question is, uh, what are your guys' score predictions for the SEC championship game, and uh, what are the key factors, you think, for each team? I Now, this one, I, I think it's going to be a lower score. I think it's – I don't think each te – I don't think a team is going to top 30. My guess is I'm going to go with Alabama 27, Georgia 17, and I think pretty much the key is – I'm just going to go with Georgia because they're the ones that they need the most help. I think the key is just find a way, and I know this is – I know this is hard. Just find a way to stop Tua. Put pressure on Tua. Make him scramble. Make him do something. Just find a way to put something on Tua because Georgia's, Georgia's offense, we know that they can score. It's going to be tough to do against Bama. But if they can somehow take Tua out of this game, just just mess with his head or something mentally, I think I think they're going to have an advantage because this is, although he's played in a national championship, 
He hasn't played in an SEC title game, so it's going to be a brand new stage for him. He could have some jitters, so I think if they have any chance, get something on Tua. Yeah, I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I'll say 24-14 Bama. It's a little early, but, but well, I mean, well, in terms of score predictions, I think it's a little early. It doesn't matter. I'm taking Bama either way. <laughs> But um, I think it'll be low scoring. And, yeah, I think if they can figure out a way to somewhat get into his head, pressure him a little bit, put him in a situation where he hasn't been in before, and I think George is looking pretty good. I'm going to say 28-17 Bama, and we've said it so many times on this show, this is this Alabama team might be one of the greatest college football teams we've ever seen, and, and we'll see how the rest of the year plays out. But for Georgia, if they have a way to – if they can find a way to win this game – I think the key is you have to look at their own quarterback in Jake Fromm because he's had some really good games this year, and then he's had some games where he's really, really struggled. So for Fromm, it's which guy are you going to get, and can he find a way to throw the ball downfield, and can he find a way to extend plays? If Georgia can sustain some good offensive drives against that just insane Bama defense, I think they got a chance. 24-21 Alabama, a field goal game, and the factor in this game will be Georgia's offense as a whole, not just Jake Fromm, who really hasn't been talked about at all this season I when Lau brought that up, but the front seven and that front box for Alabama's defense is the best in the country. It's impossible to try to run up the gut for them. So uh, so Georgia's offense will have to try to find the holes in the exteriors and work their way outside because working up the middle will not work. Yeah, no, there's obviously a lot that can happen right now, but Thomas, I'm going to I'm gonna ask you now, obviously I'm sure everyone has Alabama as the favorite, but for you, do you think Georgia has a chance? And if you do, what do you think, like, you know, they're, they need they need to rely on most or what's, what the key is for them to win the game? Yeah, I think they have, I think they have a chance. Uh, Georgia certainly has uh, nothing to lose and everything to gain in this game, obviously, because uh, it's more of a playoff qualifier for Georgia, because um, if they lose, their season's over, so... Um, I think the key, honestly, could be Justin Fields because we were able to see how how he could throw the ball this week. Um, Throwing some pretty pretty deep on target passes. I know it's against UMass, but still, there's some good passes. Because um, if Jake Fromm struggles like he has, like he did against LSU, and he has uh, earlier in the season, Fields could be the the X factor. You never know. The really athletic, dynamic quarterback, and I don't know. It could be interesting. But I think Bama is probably going to win this game. I say low scoring. Also, I'd probably say twenty-seven twenty Bama. So, this is going to be a good SEC game. I mean, this is you can you can make a case as well that Georgia they're potentially a top four team in the country. But Thomas, thank you so much for listening and calling in. And uh, who well who knows what happens in that SEC title game? But hopefully, we can get a good game and uh, it'll be a nice low scoring, hard fought, maybe Georgia upset type of game. So hopefully, we can get something good. But thanks, Thomas. Yeah, there, y'all. Have a good night. You do the same. All right, now this next question comes from Stephen Ramsey, and he wants to know, who was the better team, the 2006 Boise State Broncos or the 2017 UCF Knights? Oh, man. I know UCF didn't lose a game. That Boise State team was really good. I mean, Kellen Moore, Doug Martin, Titus Young, if if that's the team I'm remembering right. Yeah, that was the team, 07. They were really good. It took Colin Kaepernick to bring them down. So for Boise State, I'm going to give them the slight edge. I'm going to go Boise State in that one as well. I think that they had one game that just sort of took them all over and just really go all over the place. I'm going Boise State, and I'm going to answer the phone. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with that Boise State team as well. I mean, that... It's a histor- historically that that's that Boise State team kind of changed the college football landscape at least at least for them because now Boise State they are what they are because of what that 2006 team did. Yeah, I'm taking Boise State, and uh, it's not even close for me. I mean, it, I didn't put any thought to this whatsoever. I mean, that Boise State team in 2006, um, they were. I'm, er, I'm sorry, I just clicked on the wrong thing. <laughs> that Boise State team in 2006, hey, goodbye, camera. Um, that Boise State team in 2006 was undefeated, and they beat some relevant teams that year, too, along with Oklahoma in uh, in the Fiesta Bowl here in Arizona. I mean, they they beat some relevant teams, including an Oregon State team that upset number 2 USC and finished third in a very good Pac-10 that year. So I think that Boise State team really just set the pace for what that program was going to be as a whole and succeed at the Division One level. And I think that I think that as as a program, UCF is getting there. 
and they can continue to claim and say, hey, these other schools don't want to play us, but you don't have to go straight in and play Alabama week one. You don't have to. Go in and play. Goodbye, camera. Go in and play somebody relevant. Like, before, or I brought this up a few weeks ago. Before Oregon was a top-tier program in college football, they were obviously relevant. But before they became a Pac-12 powerhouse into what these last 10 years has become, they played Boise State on the road when they were a top-20 team. Because Boise State wanted to get them to play at home, and Boise State was starting to gain some traction, so they did that. And Boise State was able to draw in teams like that, like Oregon, like Oregon State. If UCF can do that better than just beating up on these random Conference USA teams, then then I'll start giving them a lot more credit. Now, we were speaking of Florida just a few minutes ago, and now we got Tyler from Florida calling in. So, Tyler, how's it going over there, man? I'm doing fantastic. How are you guys doing today? We are doing fantastic as well. So, Tyler, first question for you is, who is your team? Uh, Florida State University. Uh, Florida State. So you guys got a we have we have a Q and A question in regards to Florida State coming up. So we'll let you listen to that. Where's for Peter a few Warren? Minutes. When you need him. Yeah, who, who knows on that one? But Tyler, what do you have for us this week? So yeah, well, my question is: so we have Florida State and Virginia Tech with the two highest bowl streaks, and they're both in jeopardy of of breaking this year. What bowl streak do you think has the best chance of surviving? Now, the ironic thing is, guys, I'm looking at the Q&A questions right now, and I, it was actually Tyler that asked that question. So I guess we're going to go right into that now. Florida now, Florida State, they, they got a tough test this week against Florida. Um, that's going to be one of our pick'em games, but I guess it's we – can, we can do a little spoiler right now where I think Florida State has – Maybe a, a 20% chance max to win that game because I think I think Florida is one of the better SEC teams and definitely a top 15 team in the country. But anything can happen in a rivalry game. Now, in regards to Virginia Tech, they're playing Virginia. I think that's a little bit of an easier matchup for them. So I, I, I hate to do this, but I say Virginia Tech probably has a better chance of making a bowl game than Florida State does. I'm going to agree. I, I don't see Florida State taking down the Gators this weekend, so I'm going to go with Virginia Tech. I see Virginia Tech. They've had a really bad loss this year. What was that against Old Dominion? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you look at that, but then Florida State's just been a, a, um, a lackluster football team this season and last as well. So I'm going to say uh, Virginia Tech's got the best chance. Now, now, Tyler, assuming you're under the age of 36, this is going to be the first time that you've uh, <laughs> experienced a bowl season without Florida State. So I'm, I'm going to throw the question to you. Um, do you think Florida State's got a chance this week, or is their 36-year reign going to come to an end? So it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I think it's going to – if you ever watch when they played Miami, I think they're going to have to play like how they did that game where they basically were playing perfect for about the first pass and then kind of fell apart. So I feel like they got to play, they have to play strong. They have to force turnovers and, and really they got to get their offense going because their offensive line is, is complete garbage. And is, if they can get something going there, then they may have a chance. But yeah, it's going to be, I think the line's uh, at four and a half at the moment in for Florida right now. Yeah, so it's so it's a pretty reasonable line, but Tyler, so best best of luck to your Knowles this week because I'm sure this is going to be a huge game for you and a, a bunch of other Seminole fans. So best of luck and hopefully, because I, I don't know if you heard a few weeks ago, but uh, our good friend Andrew was talking about how you guys are going to be bowl eligible. So maybe you guys yep. can prove him wrong. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I was listening. Out. Okay, so best of luck to you guys and thank you so much for listening and calling in this week. Yes, sir, you guys are going. All right, you too. Now, for those of you that are listening live, you can't really tell this right now, but for those of you that are going to be watching the show on YouTube, you have a fantastic treat because Josh has uh, come over and sat next to me. I guess Lyle has some sort of odor over there. He wanted nothing a part of him, so he decided to come over. <laughs> yeah, Lyle. And, I'm in another room, and I can smell it. And, yeah, and sit Lyle's next to me. Yeah, Lyle's today is just not, um, you know, ideal. Yeah, Sorry, so he man. decided to come over and sit next to me, so this is going to make things a lot easier <laughs> for me the, to edit. Is this the first time we've seen Josh on camera all show? Is the question? No, no, no. I guess so we're I gonna was find there, out. I, I was up there a little bit, but so like, yes, it's, it's gonna, gonna be, be a, it's gonna be in a bunch of clips. It's gonna that's gonna be such a pain. Hey, don't volunteer to edit. Well, since <laughs> oh boy, here we here here we go. Um, we got a few questions left. This comes from Rochelle Fisher, and I maybe it's maybe they're French, but I assume she wants to know: Do you think Kyler Murray 
will become another two-sport athlete like Deion Sanders and Bo Jackson. I feel like this is something that <laughs> hasn't really been friends. discussed about, where everyone knows that Kyler Murray has been drafted by the Oakland A's. But he's a pretty good football player, and just everyone is assuming he has no chance or any idea of playing in the NFL. I don't know. I mean, you guys saw that ring. You guys saw that... Um, wow, I, I really can't look at Blake when I'm sitting right here. So you guys saw that... Um, that that photo that came out the other day of him wearing the shoulder pads with the bat um, over his shoulders and in in the black and white that was originally a Bo Jackson thing uh, and Bo Jackson did that first great so, photo shoot yeah yeah it was fantastic great photo shoot so um, I think that there's a possibility I I I don't know what type of NFL potential that Kyler has though and that's not on that's that's not on the talent that he has. Because he's extremely talented. He's probably, in my opinion, he's, he'd be number three in the Heisman. But for me right now, it's between Gardner and Tua. But I like um, Kyler Murray at number three. So clearly he's talented enough. I just don't know if that style is going to develop for him in the NFL. And it, so far it has for Baker Mayfield for the most part. But w it, it'll be interesting to see what Kyler Murray decides to do already being drafted and signed by the Athletics. So I, I'm not really sure. Kyler actually did an interview a couple months back, and he said, like, his whole life he's always envisioned himself as a two-sport athlete, and it's something he always thought would be pretty cool to do. Like Josh said, I don't know how high his NFL upside is because he's fantastic in college. I just am not 100% sure if his game would translate to the next level. Keep in mind, that's no knock on him because he's a fantastic college football player, and clearly he's supposed to be pretty darn good in baseball considering he was drafted ninth overall. Does he give it a shot? It's possible. I mean, you look at somebody like Russell Wilson. He That's sort what of, I was going to say. He sort of tries to do it. He's been in a couple spring trainings with the Rangers and the Yankees. But to actually play two sports, to suit up every Sunday for football and then endure an entire 162-game baseball season with doing all the practices and with the two seasons kind of overlapping once September rolls around, I think nowadays it would be a little bit tough. It would almost be disappointing if he won the Heisman. Because what if, what if he won the Heisman and then just never played football? <sighs> I mean, like going I, out on just top. like Jamarcus Russell. Yeah. Oh wait, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hey, did you guys hear that real quick? Because we brought up Jamarcus Russell. Did you hear the story that came out about him last week? Yeah, about his first like two years in the NFL. Mm -hmm. That was great. He didn't watch film, so coaches would give him like oh, actual yeah. sets of film, and they were blank. And the next day at practice, he'd be like, hey, did you watch that Blitz package? He's like, yeah, absolutely. I watched all two hours of it and did this and that and have notes for it. They were blank tapes. He didn't watch film in the NFL. What are you doing? It sounds a lot like that movie Draft Day with uh, Bo Callahan when he said, oh, 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 yeah, I, I watched it. And he actually, he didn't. But I believe right now we have a frequent caller who always delivers a fantastic question. Uh, now, Andrew, I know you're coming <laughs> off a very, very disappointing loss to uh, the Fa from the Falcons today, so I'm sure you're a little bummed about that. But hey, Clemson won, and you're still undefeated, so you got that going for you, Andrew. How are you doing tonight? Uh, yeah, can we not talk about the Falcons season anymore? <laughs> Last week we lose to the Browns. This week we're losing to the Cowboys. Man, I don't think this season is over, so I'm just going to focus on the offseason for that. But I'm doing well. Besides that, Clemson looked pretty good after a slow start yesterday. But how are you guys doing? Well, the Saints are still the best team in football, Andrew. So I am Relax. just even better. Mm. Here and that makes me cringe. <laughs> Andrew, what do you have for us this week, bro? Um, my question is more with it being rivalry week, uh, week this week. What are you guys' top three rivalries in college football? Like all four of you. I like this a good one. question. I like this. Top three. Top three. Well, I'll just go right now because I already have my number one, and that's Army Navy. Oh, although it's not this week because they have you know their own weekend for it. I I think that's the best rivalry in uh, in all of college football. Uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm going USC Notre Dame. I'm going Michigan Ohio State in no particular order. And uh, ooh, this this last one could be interesting. I, I you could go Iron Bowl. I kind of like Oklahoma Texas. But be, but since it's in the middle of the season, it doesn't have that rivalry that rivalry yeah. feel to it. So I, I'll go I'll go I'll go Iron Bowl. It's, I've got Michigan Ohio State. I've got Notre Dame USC. So those two are similar to Josh's. I love the Red River Showdown too, and I love that Golden Hat that gets rewarded after every uh, year. 
But since, like you said, it's in the middle of the season, my third one, I'll, I'll go with the Apple Cup just since I grew up watching it All in right. Washington, Washington State, and especially this year, it's going to be pretty good. Ohio State, Michigan, number one, hands down for me. Army, Navy, number two, because it's after everything in this season. Mm-hmm. And so it's just the only college football game that weekend. Everybody watches it. It always just seems to be snowing. Like, no matter where it is, it just seems to be snowing. Yeah. And um, IU Purdue. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> we, all, we all picked our own. We all picked our own. Now, Andrew, I know you got a, a good old rivalry game this week with South Carolina, but for you, in your opinion, in your personal favorite, uh, what's your favorite rivalry game? Um, Well, kind of hard to go against number one being Michigan-Ohio State for me just because of how much usually is at stake and all the hate usually that goes on. Uh, two, definitely Army-Navy just because of the tradition between the two schools and just more it's called the game of honor. Uh, three, I'm going to go with the Iron Bowl between Auburn and Alabama just because I'm me living in the South and I'm, a lot of my mom's family is from Alabama. I know how huge that rivalry is. I think people don't realize sometimes how big of a rivalry that is just because Alabama has lately dominated. But for a while, it was Auburn that was dominating this rivalry. So it's been for a while, or time has been split 50 50, but it's, man, people usually, you're on one, in Alabama, you're on one side of the fence or the other. You're not in the middle. And it's, it's, it's pretty crazy some of the stuff that, like, it separates. It's like pair families apart and stuff. It's crazy as that may sound. But, yeah, definitely Michigan-Ohio State, uh, Army-Navy, and then the Iron Bowl. Rivalry Week is definitely one of the best weekends in all of college football. Andrew, best of luck this week against uh, the other USC. No, no, no <laughs> USC Junior. Get it right. <laughs> yes, you, you. One hell of a job. And only thing else I got to say is, how about them, yeah! uh, what? I, I don't, I, Andrew, I apologize. Brady's <laughs> having fun with the soundboard, but uh, enjoy this week and uh, go Tigers. All right, man. Thank you. Go Tigers. Have a great Thanksgiving. You do, man. Brady, what was that for? Yeah, what was, what that? was that? Oh, he's okay, on the phone. On the phone. All right, it, next question, boy. He's avoiding the question. Yeah. No, he, he said he didn't want to talk about the Cowboys, so I ended it with the how about them Cowboys. Oh, because oh, we couldn't God. really, it was like, it sounded muffled. Oh, it, did it? It sounded muffled, so we have, we have one. On we have, well, how about them Cowboys, and also go Tigers. We have one more question. This comes from Blake Walker. This is kind of a real fun one. Since it's rivalry week, what is your guys' favorite rivalry trophy? Well, oh. I'll start off, and uh, after talking about this first one we're not going to talk about it for the rest of the show all right victory bell usc ucla um moving on uh, the stanford axe in the big game between cal and stanford i mean that thing's awesome that thing's awesome and so is the paul bunyan axe so i'm going to loop them in together uh but paul bunyan's coming up again the jeweled shillelagh again after this weekend not going to want to talk about it uh have fun lyle uh and then i also like the paul bunyan trophy you just between... named all of them <laughs> i named four all right all right and then the Paul Bunyan Trophy between uh, between uh, Michigan and Michigan State. I think the, anything with Paul Bunyan is cool. I like the USC ones. And then I think the Stanford Axe is just sick. I love the golden hat from the Red River Showdown, but that's middle of the year. From Rivalry Week. Honestly, I love that Iron Bowl trophy. I think they call it just like the sportsmanship trophy. But it's just it's huge, and I just think it's a really, really cool trophy that they hand out every year. The Florida, Georgia, the giant ore that they have. That's a really cool one. Also, I like the Territorial Cup. It's small. It's a little bit of nothing. But it's the oldest college football rivalry trophy in all of college football. See, I like the, the tradition and the history behind the trophy and behind the rivalry. But the trophy itself is underwhelming. I mean, it's the size of a coffee cup. What is, um, oh, um, there's like a golden ore that's a, Minis- I believe, Minnesota it's a Minnesota rivalry. Minnesota game. and Wisconsin are the the, Paul the little brown. Axe. No, oh yeah, they're Paul Bunyan's axe. And then somebody's the little brown jug. Isn't that Minnesota, Michigan? I don't remember. Somebody's a little brown jug, and that thing's weird too. I don't know who it is, but somebody I like. I have the list right now of like all the ones, and that's the Egg Bowl. <laughs> I like the one they give. And, and now, <laughs> Michigan, Minnesota is the little brown jug. jug. And Who's now, the Egg Bowl. Who's the Egg Bowl? It's uh, Mississippi State Ole Miss. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, another one I like, it's very kind of just underwhelming. It's SMU and TCU, but it's the Iron Skillet. Oh, they can cook up some some 
some giblets. They definitely got some interesting <laughs> ones. If you have, if you have like ten minutes, what you guys just want. What about the wanna... uh, Boise State Fresno State milk can? I did like some of these. I I, I, I got a read. list of all of like them. Like BYU too. Utah State, the old wagon yeah. wheel. Cincinnati Louisville, the keg of nails. <laughs> In, <laughs> Indiana hey. Kentucky, the bourbon barrel. The like, bourbon. I didn't even know Oregon, that Oregon that was a thing. State. Oregon Oregon State, the platypus. Oh yeah, the platypus trophy. There's one that uh, the the Iowa Iowa State one is called the Cyhawk Trophy, and that is the laziest name of any trophy in college uh, football. The Ohio State Illinois, the Eli Buck. Oh, that one's, the that one's or whatever it is. What about yeah. Florida Miami, the Seminole War Canoe? Can I can I change my answer? <laughs> yes. The Commander in Chief Trophy. Ah, yeah, that's a good one. All right, now <laughs> we are going to transition into the nope. victims, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, the phone lines are closed. I, I am sorry. Thank you to all those that uh, called in or that tried to call in. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time, so we're going to get some more of those phone calls next week, and that was just... That timing was so... Nope. <laughs> that timing was okay, so Okay, Floyd perfect. Mayweather. So, unfortunately, yeah. No more no more phone calls. Now, for the Pickums... Uh. I don't know what he's doing. Now, for the Pickums this week, guys, we're going to start with Lyle Goder Brady, then we're going to have Josh and I go, because one... That's going to make things a lot easier for me to edit if I just have us on the same camera going back to back. So as I load up the uh, Pick'em music and hide my computer from Josh so he doesn't, you know, steal my answers. because I've I've been showing him mine the entire time. I didn't even realize. Because we have about 20 minutes to get through about 23 or 24 game, guys. We got a whole lot of games this week because it's rivalry week. So I just thought we'd have a lot of extra. And also, boys... The Pick'em standings are so close, and I guess, well, there is a little there is a little delay, so that that is okay. This is technically, well, I guess, I guess if we're going to count conference title games, it's not technically the last week, but it's the last major week where we can get a ton of games in. In last place with 83 points uh. is Brady. <gasps> Ty, I'm sorry? You have 83. In last? Yes, unfortunately, you're in last. Tied Yippee. with 84 is Lyle and myself. How? And with 85 is Josh. So boys, that is blast. We got about we got about a week and a half kind of games left and the difference between first and last is 2 points. Oh, here we go, boys. Oh yeah. Oh yes, but and speaking I'm going of back things, for my crown. Speaking of things getting interesting, we go over to the ESPN Pickums oh. League for the Harris Highlights group and we have a four-way tie. Whoa. With 84 points, we have Don Pablo, a Q ratings. Greer for Heisman yep. and Meep one. Meep. <laughs> so we got four. So this thing's going to come down to the final wire as well. But we got a lot of games, guys. And we got about, as I said, 20 minutes to do it. So let's go through these as quickly as we can. Houston at Memphis. No, 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 no. It's him. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. This is going to be weird. <laughs> I know. It's going to be confusing. No, Ed Oliver. I like Memphis at home. Memphis, Brady White, because his name's Brady. Uh, Brady White, because I watched him in high school, and he's a former Sun Devil. Fur Devils. I like Houston. Nebraska at Iowa. Low scoring game. Big Ten showdown. I got to go with Iowa at home. I'm waving hi to Iowa. Go Iowa. Iowa. Nebraska. Oklahoma at West Virginia. This is going to be a good game. No doubt about it. Um, Oklahoma close. West Virginia coming off a loss. I don't think they can rebound against a really good Oklahoma team. I think Kyler puts on a show this week. This game also on a Friday. A good, a good slate of Friday games this week, guys. I'm going Oklahoma. I hate picking against West Virginia, but I'm going Oklahoma. Yeah, I, I really wanted to pick West Virginia, and I might have if they had gotten out of uh, out of Stillwater with a win this past week, but they didn't. I'm taking the Sooners. I'm taking the Sooners as well. Washington at Washington State. I'm going out on a limb here, guys. I'm taking the Cougars by 17 points. Wazoo, two touchdowns. Washington State, three touchdowns. Oh. Washington State. Four. 69 points. Nine field goals and uh, safety thrown in there with a blocked extra point. Okay, maybe I didn't go out on such a limb. 21 for 21. And a pick six. 26. Uh, where does, they're they're going to win by about 30. Where does Gardner Minshew fit <laughs> now, into all that? I, I, I think this is going to be a closer game than people are giving credit for. Washington, they're still a good team. I think I think Wazoo's going to win by about 10. There's my uh, there's my pick. Oklahoma State at TCU. Oklahoma State is the best five-loss nope, team you, in Josh. college football. I'm just throwing it out okay, there. Okay, I thought you were going. Oh. <laughs> I agree with you, Josh. That's why I'm taking the Cowboys to beat TCU. I'm going TCU because I'm still on the Horned Frog train from last year. 
Well, boys, I wasn't just letting you know. I lost track of the order again. <laughs> I know you did. I'm taking Oklahoma State. <laughs> I'm taking Oklahoma State as well. Baylor at Texas Tech. Texas Tech. I like the Red Raiders at home. Texas Tech, not at home. This game's at Jerry World. Ah. Okay, I'm... so it's technically Texas Tech's home game then, right? It's also yes, technically it's Baylor's Tech's home, home game. game as well. I believe so. Because aren't both like AT&T whatever field? One of them is AT&T Stadium. The other one is AT&T Jones Stadium. Like AT&T, uh, something like that. Did it? Did Brady pick? Wait, who's AT&T picking? Stadium, Arlington, Texas. I'm going Texas Tech. Um. Well, the Raiders were in Arizona today, and they beat Josh Rosen and the Cardinals. Cardinals. So I'll really? take the Red Raiders over the Baylor Bears this week. And I'm going to take Texas Tech as well. Syracuse at Boston College. I like Syracuse. I think they bounce back after a tough week this week. I still think this is a good team with some nice pieces to it, and I think they find a way to beat a Boston College team that is, eh, I'll call them subpar. If Syracuse, depending on their quarterback scenario, if, say, their backup quarterback gets a full week to practice, you got to go Syracuse. I'm going Syracuse in this one. Yeah, for, for my friends at Cuse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the orange uh, over Boston College. I'm going to go with Boston College. Florida at Florida State. Gators on the road. The streak is broken for the Seminoles. Mm. Gators. Florida over Florida State in an absolute blowout. I think Florida State makes this a game. I think Florida State has a lead in the third quarter. But I'm going to go with the Gators in this one. Marshall at Florida International. FIU, like the Panthers. FIU, T-Y, T-Y, T-Y Hilton. Is this the worst of the worst this week? No. no. Really? Because these Florida teams Inter have a combined seven. No, they don't do. Florida International is like, has seven or eight wins. Oh, I'm looking at last year. Oh, uh, that's and not it's good. fine. We are Marshall. <laughs> Florida International. Purdue at Indiana. Rondell Moore goes off against the Hoosiers. Sorry, Brady, I'm taking Purdue. Rondell Moore is going to go off against the Hoosiers, but Stevie Scott will fire right back for the Hoosiers. I'm going Hoosiers by 50. Woo. Oh, boy. <laughs> Battle the old oak and bucket. Coming back to Bloomington. All I'm going to say is... Not 50. All I'm going to say is, Brady, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> do I think IU's going to win? No, I really don't. Do I want them to win? Yeah, I really do. Good for you. Go Hoosiers. <laughs> Blake? I said, oh, you picked? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Purdue. Wake Forest at Duke. Duke. Daniel Jones picks apart this Wake Forest team. Wake Forest on the road. Duke. This is gross. Duke. Gross. Troy at Appalachian State. I'm taking Troy on the road. App State at home. ASU, baby. <laughs> App State. Louisiana at UL Monroe. I'm going to go with Louisiana. I just, I got a gut feeling. Which former ASU coach is at Monroe? Uh, Billy, Billy Napier. Napier. Billy Napier. Do we miss him, guys? Absolutely. <laughs> Billy Napier, UL Monroe. Well, Billy Napier followed me on Twitter. Nice. And then when he took the UL Lafayette job, he unfollowed me on Twitter. <laughs> Sick brag. Um, <laughs> so for that reason, I still wish he was our offensive coordinator, and I'm taking Louisiana. I'm taking Louisiana as well. Auburn and Alabama. Oh, man. The Iron Bowl. Man, I'm excited for this one. Not really. Bama's going to win by 30. Abilama. <laughs> I'm going Alabama in this game. Um, I think that Alabama is going to challenge a play at the end of the game. I think they're going to kick a 55-yard field goal. I think they're going to miss it, and I think Auburn's going to take it to the house for a kick six. Oh, wait, no, that was 2013. Yeah, yeah. That was 2013. I'm taking Bama by 30 points, at least. Yeah, Auburn's going to be really upset the Citadel made this past week in a game because Alabama's going to make sure that they're not tied aside from the 0-0 zero zero aspect. I'm going to go with Bama. Huge. Tennessee at Vanderbilt. Volunteers. I like Tennessee. Tennessee. Rocky Top. You'll always be. Yeah. I'm going to go with <laughs> Vanderbilt. LSU at Texas A&M. I think this one actually stays pretty close, but I'm going to say the Tigers take this one on the road. Um, I'm gonna go with LSU, and I was trying to delay myself because I couldn't find my Coach O soundbite. Oh no! G E A U X Tigers, Tigers in this one. So now we go from a game of Aggies 
to another game of Aggies with Utah State at Boise State. I'm going with the Aggies. Utah State needs some love. I'm taking them to win. I just found my sound bite. I'm sad now. <laughs> uh, I'm going Boise State at home on the Smurf turf. Yeah, you know what? Utah State struggled a little bit with Colorado State and had that last touchdown taken off the board. Yeah, they should have lost that game. They should have lost that game, and Boise State ended up getting a pretty big win, so I'm taking the Broncos. I'm going to take Boise State in this one as well. Probably the most underwhelming Notre Dame at USC game in our lifetime, to say the least, but it's, it's still a game that's going to happen because it has to according to the schedule. Well... I'm excited it is because I'm excited I'm going. Josh was gracious enough to let me stay at his house and go to this game with him. Yeah, so you're, you're welcome. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. It's okay because we're going to support the school that we go to's oh. game against it's okay, U of Blake. A. Just, we'll how talk many, about how that many times have we? How right. many times have we been over this? ASU's not my favorite team. Like I don't know. I don't know how to get this through your head. It's okay, Brady. We'll have fun supporting our that school that we go to's amazing game. Like for the rivalry game, the only time we go here where they're going to be at Tucson the rest of our lives, while we're students. Okay. Because well, are we going to be adults going to this game in our 40s, you know, heckling little kids? Will. Okay, I mean, yeah, we probably will. <laughs> Let's we'll just run. go for basketball. Well, my, we're, a, we're a hockey I'm school I'm excited now. to try to see, to see we my... We are a hockey school, Well, yes. I'm excited to see my favorite team potentially lock up a playoff spot this weekend. Having said that, the Irish always struggle at the Coliseum, and I know this isn't the same USC team of years past, but they still have a lot of talent. They still can play some good games at home, and again, it's a rivalry game. Anything can happen. I like the Irish, but I'm going to take them, um, I'm going to say by 12. I think it stays close. I'm going Notre Dame. USC by a field goal. I love it. No, I'm totally joking. This is going to be a 42-point oh. football game. 42 points. 42 points. Wow. This is the worst USC team I have ever seen. Maybe that's why Max, or our unnamed college football expert, didn't want to come on the show today. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. <laughs> Shh. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm going to go with Notre Dame in this one. Michigan at Ohio State. Wolverines. Ohio State does not have it. I know it's on the road, but I'm taking Michigan by 14. O H I O. Let's go, Bucks. Michigan by nine. Get that one out. I think Michigan is the better team, but at home, mm -hmm. Ohio State's one of the best offensive teams in the country, and I think Michigan's going to be without Chase Winovich this week. I think he like broke his collarbone. Chase apparently. So I have some. There's some. There's some. A lot of story behind this. People were. Fan or people were mad at Chase Winovich or at IU for a dirty hit where Chase Winovich got up on the play before, saw a guy under him and stomped three times on his leg and got I saw that. called. So Chase Winovich, you kinda had it coming, buddy. So I for that very reason, I'm gonna go with Ohio State in this one, which brings us to the worst of the worst. It was hard finding the worst of the worst game because not a lot of bad teams playing each other, so we're gonna have some former well-known teams that have made it into the worst worst this year make another appearance, and that's Old Dominion at Rice. Oh, man. I don't even have a story this week. I wanted to change it up for Rivalry Week, so I'm going Old Dominion on the road. So this is the third cheapest ticket you can get in college football this weekend. The first actually features a ranked team. Really? Tickets to the Illinois Northwestern game are as low as $2. Is this game Four dollars. Four dollars for the cheapest ticket. Wow. Do you have it pulled up? No, I actually okay. don't. Okay. All right. Look well, since this is such a cheap game and it's at Rice, I'm going a cheap answer because I can't think of anything funny. So I'm going Old Dominion because why, Lyle? Because why not, Brady? Why not? Well, earlier this year, Rice was in our worst of the worst, and I chose them because, you know, I like Rice. Um, but here's the issue, guys. I was making chicken a few nights ago. How was it? And... The chicken was great. So my mom sent me bagged rice that she just put in the microwave. Yeah, I, minute, I didn't, like, I didn't like know this minute was rice? Thing. Huh? Like minute rice? Yeah, like yeah, Uncle Eddie's or something. Put a little water in no, it? No, 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 no. You just rip off the top, put it in the microwave for 90 seconds, and they're like, oh, ready to eat. No, it was <laughs> not. It was disgusting. And for that reason, I'm taking Old Dominion. I'm going with Old Dominion. Which brings us to the battle, the quest... The journey, the test, for the Territorial Cup. Perfect nice. timing. <laughs> and that is Arizona State at Arizona. I heard a crescendo coming. I just needed to kill it. Love it. It's going to be close. I think ASU bounces back from this last week against Oregon. I think Arizona 
bounces back from this past week up in Pullman. So I think both teams are playing with something to prove. I think ASU wants to finish this year on a high note under Herm, and I think they're going to do so. Khalil Tate's going to have a good game, but the Sun Devil defense now fully equipped with a full game of Merlin Robertson. They're going to find a way to get it done. Sun Devils by 10. This past week, the Sun Devils were missing their top three defensive players in the first half and then top two, you could say, in the second half. Jalen Harvey out as well. And I believe Demonte King was not in there either. And this game is a battle for territory, the Territorial Cup. That's how it got its name, guys. Think about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Battle for territory. This game for the Sun Devils... It's your seniors and your one junior's last game. Eh, two juniors, if you're going to say Cole Cabral. <laughs> Nikhil, come back. <laughs> Please come back, Nikhil. I think the Sun Devils are going to go down to Tucson and smack the Bearcats. Mm. Smack them. Not even the Bearcats. Club. Wildcats. Wildcats. I'm thinking Cincinnati. Bear down. Who Bear cares? Bear down the Cats. Who cares? Nobody. Sorry, Kendall. No one cares. It. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. So I'm going to go ASU in this game because they need to finish the season on a high note because the Las Vegas Bowl really isn't that pretty. No, oh, it is Vegas. It's flashy, but I'm going ASU in this one. So I, I don't even want to talk about this last week's game. I, I am, I'm still upset about ASU's loss last night. I have not gotten over it. It'll take me until next Saturday to get over it, and then I'll have to get over USC's 42-point loss. Um, but here's the thing. I, you know, I think ASU, it, it's disappointing because if we were – Last year, ASU was 6-5 and five with the opportunity to beat U of A, go to 7-5 and five on the season, and get the Territorial Cup back to Tempe. I was excited. I was thrilled for the game. But now that ASU probably should have won the Pac-12 South and didn't, you know, it just seems like kind of a nothing game. So I think ASU is going to figure out a way to get fired up for it. And you know what? This is the only rivalry in college football that is forged from more than just sports and academics. It's forged from a political background because Arizona actually protested and revolted trying to make sure that ASU could not become a school. And you know what, guys? That's messed up. It's hate week, boy. That's messed up. And it's hate week with a capital A. I'm taking the Sun Devils on the road. We are a school. A better one. Deal with it. I like the Sun Devils in this game as well, and I'm still going to cry myself to sleep tonight over that game last night that ASU could have won, probably should have won. I Two-point conversions should be reviewed, guys. They I, probably should be. I, I love Ducks. They're so cute and all, but I hate the Oregon Ducks. Puddles, I love you. Come on, dude. It's it's okay, but hopefully we got a good game next week. Now, the the USC-Notre Dame game is a nighttime game, right? Yes. So perfect, you guys can watch the game at 1.30 yes. and then watch... The USC game. We will tailgate and then go that, inside. I was going to say, that's exactly what we're doing. We're Fantastic. tailgating to watch the game first. Fantastic. Blake and I will be down in Tucson. And I'll oh, be wearing yes. all ASU gear at USC. Super duper. But that does wrap up this episode of the Harris Highlights show. This was interesting having Josh on camera with me. It's kind of fun. Are you going to slide out of the camera yeah. at the end of it? It's kind of nice. slide out and back in. So uh, cool. thank you guys for watching. Uh, for those of you that tuned in live on BlazeRadioOnline.com, thank you. For those of you that followed along with us on Twitter, thank you. And for those of you that are just, you know, enjoying a Sunday night, you know, wherever you may be, thank you. Sunday fun too. day. Sunday fun day. Hopefully we got some uh, good rivalry games this week, some, some good wins, some good plays, and some good trophies. But for Josh Schaefer, Lyle Goldstein, Brady Klein, this has been Blake Harris from the Bill Austin Radio Studio at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. And we will see you guys next week.